picture. Now, last week we didn't get one, but they're up there in the fellowship hall on the table, okay? So if you want one from last week, um, after church, you can go get one. So what does this one say? Watch. What do you think the Bible story is about? If you had to guess, I'm going to give you a clue. About watching, yeah. So Jesus tells a story about how we need to watch and be ready for God to come back. And he says it's like a man who goes away on a journey, and he puts people in charge of the house so that it'll be ready when he gets home. So soon we're going to hear about Jesus dying on the cross, and then he's going to be raised from the dead on, what's the day that Jesus is raised from the dead? Easter, of course. And then when he's raised from the dead, he's going to spend some time with his disciples, but then he's going to ascend and be with God. And so he's going to be gone. So Jesus is gone for a while, and now it's up to us to watch. That's right, we're to wait. We're to watch. So does that mean every morning you get up and look out your window and you watch for Jesus? Maybe. I mean, if you want to do that, you can. Uh, but Jesus wants us to be ready, not just with our eyes, but with our heart. So how do we watch for Jesus with our heart? Maybe we pray, yeah? Maybe we keep in touch with God. Yeah, if you know someone's gone, gone far away on a trip, um, when your dad goes away, for instance, do you ever um, get to Skype with him when he's away in another country? Yeah, do you ever get to do that? Get to see. So, yeah, there's ways to keep in touch while they're away so we know when they're coming back. We can watch and be ready. All right. Will you pray with me? And you all can pray with me too. Dear Jesus, help us to watch and wait for you. Amen. All right. Thanks for being such a great helper and listener. So, today I'm going to focus on the second reading and the gospel. That's kind of tandem passages for us. The gospel lesson is, well, um, it's a story with a real strong picture. It's easy to picture something that we may have smelled a strong perfume before. We can imagine a dinner happening with friends around a table. We can fill in the details of that picture. The reading from Philippians, it's maybe harder to picture because it's Paul kind of thinking back to his past, to his history. But I'm going to ask you to do both, to sort of make a picture in your mind and also to think back. First, let's look more closely at this gospel reading, and then I'll have a question for you to think back. So in the gospel, Mary does something very seemingly foolish, She takes a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. Now, what we need to know about that is that it was costly. And that is reinforced because of what Judas says. And regardless of Judas' motives, we know that because of his interest in this, it was worth something, this perfume. He says, why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? And it tells us in the little parentheses, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he wanted a, a piece of that action. He saw a very costly thing and thought, I want some of that. I wonder if maybe he was jealous of the attention that Jesus received. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. Well, here's the question that we're going to ask later. Why is she breaking it open now? But first, the question that's going to ask you to think back. Have you ever bought something costly for Jesus? Have you ever bought something costly for Jesus? Now, maybe it's a better place to start to work our way into that question to say, have you ever bought something expensive? You buy an expensive car until you drive it off the lot, and then it's just not as expensive anymore, right? It was expensive before you bought it, and it's expensive when it's time to repair it. Maybe you bought braces. Well, they're expensive, right? Maybe you bought even expensive perfume. 
What's the most expensive perfume you ever purchased? I'm asking you a lot of questions just to think about, just to kind of keep these logged in your, in your brain. We can think of all the expensive things we may have bought. Expense is relative. You know, for, for some, uh, a, a trinket or a bauble uh, or an expensive thing uh, is not so expensive for others. So expense is relative. So keep that kind of in yourself. You ever bought a real expensive thing? Now, have you ever bought an expensive thing for Jesus? In asking myself this question, I, I don't know that I have. A seminary education is very expensive. In fact, there's been work in recent years on the ELCA's behalf to, or, or part, to work on the behalf of students going into seminary to help eliminate their debt from day one. Folks have a lot of misconceptions about how much money the church has. Uh, remember, we are the church. We make church happen. Um, you know, so however much money the church has as well, what's in your wallet? Um, this is what we've got. But, but the larger church, well, doesn't the larger church help out congregations? Doesn't the synod give gifts to congregation and help out sometimes? Recently, our synod gave us the sabbatical grant that enabled uh, this congregation to send this pastor on a two-month sabbatical without incurring any debt. It's a very good thing. Um, it helped quite a bit. Well, we already had some of that set aside, so we were able to do that well. But that was a very costly gift. Seminary is a very costly thing. So maybe maybe I have bought a very extravagant and costly gift. Spent five years of my life and a lot of uh, money invested in that. But I did get a few seminary loans. The nice thing about the seminary loans, pay them back as you can without interest. Oh, if all loans were that way, wouldn't that be the different world that we live in? So, but, but beyond that, I don't know that I could think of going to a store and picking something out for Jesus. Going into a, a shop and picking something out. I remember... Um, like it was yesterday, because it was, uh, my wife and I were down in Sumner looking through the antique stores, and I found a, a, a neat thing that I wanted to buy. It wasn't very costly, but it was for me. It was not something I bought for Jesus. I didn't buy it thinking, ooh, I bet Jesus will love this. Picking it out, and then how would you give it to him? If you bought something for him, whether it was costly or not, how would you give it to Jesus? Today, it's a hard question to answer because, well, as we just talked about in the children's sermon, Jesus is not here. If you want to see the hands and feet of Jesus, look down. We, body of Christ, we believers, are to be Jesus to our neighbor and to the world. The Spirit of God, of course, moves. Maybe, maybe we can offer it like the sacrifices of old. Some of the sacrifice offered in the temple was to be eaten by the priests or be eaten by the uh, people in a feast or a fellowship uh, day of sorts. But some of it was to be burned up completely. Maybe we can give it to Jesus by putting it on a big fire. We'll buy something. I'm going to buy Jesus a lazy boy because he looks tired. And I'm going to sit it, sit it out here on a big bonfire and we're going to burn it up. And the smoke of that, so, of that uh, recliner will go up and be pleasing in the nostrils of God. That's how the scriptures des describe it. You know, that seems silly, doesn't it? No, we wouldn't really do that. Perhaps, perhaps since we are the hands and feet of Jesus, we can do what Jesus says. If you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So maybe we can buy an expensive thing and give it away to someone who needs it. We can buy an extravagant gift. In that way, we are indeed serving God, and we are living out God's command to share from our abundance, to give, to give joyfully. We, 
we certainly can do that. But I don't think that has the same character as what Mary did. This seemingly extravagant waste. Why would I say waste? Because of that other question I asked. You always have... Uh, Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. And then why did she crack it open on that day? Jesus was still alive. Maybe Mary had been to a retirement seminar and heard the advice that I often give to retirees, and that is, start giving away your possessions now. Not just because I want you to include the church in your bequest but simply because you will find more joy in the giving while you are alive than you will on the other side of the grave. If you uh, are blessed to be, perhaps blessed is not the right word, to be able to watch what happens to your stuff from heaven, not that it will matter in the presence of Christ, but you work with me. If we get to look back and see our kids and others dispensing of our property. Will they care for it in the same way we did? Will they value it like we did? Probably not. You might be surprised at some things they do value. And that is at the heart of what we're talking about is value. What things do you value? I know we're not supposed to be people of possessions, We're supposed to be people of spiritual values, not earthly things. And yet, uh, God gave us the command, you shall not steal. Why wouldn't he give us that if it didn't matter to have possessions? God knows we need possessions, so what do we value? What things do we value? It's fair to answer that question. Mary took this costly perfume used it to anoint Jesus before he was dead. We're going to finish that one. Don't worry. Let's look at Paul's ideas. Paul talks about his zeal in persecuting the church, his pedigree as a Pharisee, well, as a Hebrew, like a Pharisee as to keeping the law, he says, as to righteousness under the law. He was blameless. He did everything everything right, he says. We know that that's not true for a person to be able to keep the law 100%. But Paul is exaggerating for the purpose of making his point. Yet whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. And listen to the language that he uses further down. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. Anyone here seen the trash train? You may have and not realized it. You know, those containers that they stack up on freight cars, there's a sort of a low, flat car, and the container, bottom one sits down in it, and the top one sits on top of that. They look like big shipping containers with sort of a tarp over the top. And they're usually blue, a little dingy blue, sort of a dingy light blue. They're heading south from Seattle down into the Columbia River Gorge. Where do they go? Away. And what are they hauling? Trash. Where are they taking it? Away. Suppose you could follow it and find out where they dump it if you're really interested. I bet the people of Oregon would like you to be interested. Where does our trash go? Somewhere? Well, to the dump. Ah, I talked about the trash train, the trash from Seattle, but were you thinking about this down here? Rubbish. That's the word. Rubbish. Take your most expensive and wonderful and valued and treasured possession. Put it in one of those cans and wait for the truck with the arms to come pick it up. Dump it in and haul it off. Why would you do that? 
because you found the surpassing love of Christ. And now take your reputation, any social standing you may have, any political affiliation that matters to you, throw it away. Why would you do that? Because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. You see, Paul is expressing his joy at having found the love of Christ. Now, Paul, who never met Christ in the flesh, well, that we know of, who met Christ, the risen risen Christ, on the road, blinded by the light of Christ, touched by the love of God, Paul has felt the love of Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, he says. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Not because of anything he's done, but because of what Jesus did. And this is after the resurrection. This is in hindsight. Paul has the benefit of hindsight. He can look back and say, now that I know what costly love I have received, I can, without fear, consider everything else as rubbish. Something that could be hauled off and thrown away, thrown away, because I know Jesus loves me. So how then can Mary with Jesus there in the flesh give away such a costly thing. It was probably expensive. Judas certainly thinks it was. But what I mean to say is that it may have cost Mary quite a bit of money to obtain this perfume. And it was to be used for his anointing after he was dead. And here he is alive. While I don't think she went to a retirement seminar and heard the advice to give away your things while you're still alive, I think there is something of the character of that in what Mary does. For a while, Paul has become aware of the surpassing love of Christ after the death of Jesus. Mary Mary has somehow become attuned to the special significance of Jesus in her midst. Mary is displaying her love for God in this great sacrificial gift. So now let me ask the question again. Have you ever bought anything expensive for Jesus? Anything costly? Well, if you haven't yet, we have an opportunity. God will give us an opportunity question is, will we step up to the register and make our purchase when the time comes? Will we break it open and spread it on Jesus' feet? What she did made such an impression that it was recorded by the gospel writer. What she did made such an impression that Judas, whose motives were not right, spoke up and protested What she did made such an impression on Jesus that he spoke on her behalf. Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, did Jesus say that as a political statement that we will always have the poor? Unfortunately, that statement of Jesus has been co-opted by some with agendas who would say, well, you know, Jesus said it. Of course we'll always have the poor. We don't really have to do anything about them. That's not what it means. It's only because Judas brought it up that Jesus responds with it. We should focus as Christians on the second half of what he said, but you do not always have me. We don't have him in the flesh. We are called to be like the watchman and wait and look for his return. But in the meantime, we shouldn't let that stop us from buying that costly thing for God. Whether it costs us physical cost, money, or time, 
whether it costs us spiritual, emotional, or relational cost. The time comes. How can we anoint God? How can we anoint Jesus and display our love for God because he has loved us in a costly way?